Hi, Avril here from Access Credit Union. We are delighted to once again sponsor the Star Sports Podcast. As part of our range of new business loans, we now offer Cultivate Farm Finance, the farmer-friendly loan package. With a Cultivate loan, farmers in West Cork can benefit from the local decision-making and personal service offered by Access Credit Union. To find out more, go to accesscu.ie forward slash cultivate, call me on 085 268 2727 or 028 21883, where a member of our team will be happy to help you with your inquiry. Close your eyes and pull like down. <laughs> And a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam McGuire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. Before we kick things off I'd just like to give a gentle reminder to our listeners and viewers to please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you in association with our friends at Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union where your bank really does matter. Choose a credit union, choose local, choose community. On this week's show, we're looking ahead to Cork's All-Ireland quarter-final against Dublin at Crow Park this Saturday at 6pm. And in a few moments, we'll be joined by our analysis dream team of ex-Cork footballers Dermot Duggan and Michal Holly O'Sullivan. Later on the show, we're chatting to Ireland international sprinter Joan Healy about her plans and ambitions for the season ahead. But Kieran, before we chat to Holly and Dermot, last week's guest on the show, Lydia Heafy, had a successful trip to Poznan, and as did several of her Skibbereen rowing club teammates at the World Cup 2 over the weekend. Yeah, Skib rowers did what they do best and they won medals on the world stage. So this was World Cup 2 in Poznan. It was the second World Cup regatta of three this year, but it was the first time that Rowing Ireland sent a team to, to, the, to this year's World Cup series. So Rowing Ireland sent eight crews and six of them came home with medals, which was a fantastic return. And the Rowing Ireland team finished fourth in the overall medals table. So that just goes to show and highlight again the strength of rowing in Ireland right now. And right in the middle of it were our Skibbereen rowers. So we'd four rowers out there, Jack. We'd Fintan McCarthy and Gary O'Donovan. They went in the lightweight men's single skulls. We all know that Fintan and Paul O'Donovan won Olympic gold in the double, but the double has been parked just for the time being. So Fintan and Gary went in the single and it was a good weekend for Fintan. He came home with a silver medal. Um, he got through to the A final. He won his heat and his AB semi-final. And the final was, uh, it, it was, it was a cracker really. And um, he was in the lead up to the last 100 metres when the New Zealand single scholar came through and just pipped him right on the end. But for Fintan to come home with a silver medal, it was a good week's work or good weekend's work. Fintan actually beat Gary in their AB semi-final. And this is quite interesting when we think that the double will come back on stream quite soon with the Europeans and the worlds ahead. We don't know yet who will be in that double. It will be Fintan plus either Jake, his brother, or Gary O'Donovan, because Paul O'Donovan is just out of the double for the, for the time being due to work placement. But in that AB semi-final, Fintan finished first and Gary was fifth, and there was eight seconds between the two West Corkmen, which is a, a sizable difference on water. So we'll have to watch what happens with the, the makeup of that double in the in the weeks ahead when the selection process and trials take place. So now, now switching to the lightweight women's double, Lydia Heafy hopped in there with Mag Scrimmon, and they did brilliant as well. They came home with a bronze medal from the from their A final. And we did it on the podcast last year, and she was outlining her hopes and goals for the year. And to come home with her second international senior medal is a big boost to Lydia. Um, because Eva Casey, another skip rower, will be battling to get back into that double as well. So just like the men's double, the Irish women's lightweight double has fierce competition. And there was another medal, and it's Emily Hegarty, who's um She's a good habit, Jack, of picking up medals. She she bagged an Olympic bronze medal last year in the women's four, but at World Cup two the weekend just gone, she was in the women's pair with Fiona Murta 
And again, they won a bronze medal. So they did really, really well. Um, the Irish women's four, which had a different makeup the weekend, um, also won a medal. So just a good weekend for Irish rowing, a good weekend for skip rowing and a very good start to the international season. Because like I said, we have the European Championships coming up. We have the World Championships coming up. So more chances and opportunities for skip rowers to, to strut their stuff in the, in the world stage. Yeah, great stuff. Congratulations to all involved there. Now, on Saturday evening at six o'clock, John Cleary's Cork footballers travel to Croke Park to take on the mighty dubs in an All Ireland football quarter final. And Kieran, we're going to speak to Michal Holly O'Sullivan and Dermot Duggan in just a moment. But before we do, I want to get your thoughts briefly on this. We've spoken about this game on last week's podcast, and obviously, the the, the, the thought is that Cork have a big challenge ahead of them. But just give us your own thoughts. Do you have any confidence that Cork can go up to Dublin and take a major, major scalp? Everything would need to go right for Cork to beat Dublin on Saturday evening. OK, this isn't the Dublin team of a couple of years ago, the Dublin team that dominated the football landscape. You got to remember that they were relegated from Division One of the Football League earlier in the year. But they seem to have got their house in order during the Leinster Championship and they've been I suppose build the momentum and picking up speed. And we saw that in the, the, the semi-final against Mead. And then they annihilated Kildare in the in the Leinster final. I think it was at 5-17 or 5-18 they got. And that was five first half goals. So they put that game to bed so early on. So right there is the danger for Cork because this Dublin team has the potential to to, to I suppose give Cork a bad beating if Cork don't show up on, on Saturday. Because to be fair, this is a Cork team that's building and developing. It's a very new Cork team. Um, they barely survived in Division 2 this year. Okay, they're true to the quarterfinals, which is a superb achievement considering where they were. But we've got to remember, too, that in their last two games, they beat Loud and Limerick, who were two Division 3 teams this year. So that shows you where this Cork team are right now. On paper, there's only one winner here. It's, it's Dublin. Dublin hold the upper hand. They have the players with experience. They have the better players. They've been together longer. They know what they're doing. They know how to win. They know how to win games like this. So everything points to a Dublin win. But it's a sport. Nothing is, is, is impossible. I think, though, that I suppose we need to kind of judge how we're going to judge this Cork team right now. If you look at the Munster semi-final against Kerry, Cork did well for 50 minutes before Kerry pulled away. And that was a good 50-minute performance by Cork. I think Cork need to do something similar um, against Dublin. If they can take that to 50 or 60 minutes and be in the game, come down the home stretch, I think that is a good result. That happened a couple of years ago when they played in the Super 8s up in Cork Park 2019. Cork were within touching distance with 10 minutes to go. Dublin stepped on the afterburners. I think they rattled off two or three late goals and they finished up winning, winning quite comfortably and they hit five goals in that game. So... What we don't want is Cork to suffer a bad beating. So I think, I, I know moral victories are, are no good for this Cork team right now, and they're probably sick of hearing about it. Um, but I think an honourable defeat is probably the best result. Like, of course, we all want to see a Cork win, but we got to be realistic here too. And this is a huge test for a new team. So I'm just looking for a good performance and see where that takes Cork. Okay, Kieran, lovely stuff. Well, let's go now to our analysis. Dream team for the big game. Dear McDuggan and Michal Holly O'Sullivan. It doesn't get much tougher than this for the Cork footballers. It's Dublin in an Ireland quarterfinal in Croke Park this Saturday night. So I'm going to come to you first, Dear Mid. In some ways, this is almost a no lose situation for this Cork team. The odds are stacked against them. Dublin are the big favourites. There's not many outside of the Cork camp expecting Cork to produce a result mm. here. So Cork have it all to gain and nothing to lose. Yeah, you, you could say that, Kieran. Um, you could say they're, they're going up with a kind of a free shot. You know, anything they do will, they'll, you know, everyone is expecting Dublin to win by a long, uh, by a lot. But on the other hand, you know, uh, I suppose this Cork team have made a lot of progress over the last couple of months, you know, and it can suddenly be, um, you know, thrown out then very quickly um, if they have a very big loss, you know. So you can say they have nothing to lose, but in a way, they have a lot to lose as well because all that uh, good work could be undone very quickly with a very big hammering or big beating, you know. So uh, I wouldn't go along completely and say they have nothing to lose, you know, because they have a lot to lose because I suppose over the last couple of years, Cork, as we've often said in this podcast before, you know, they've taken one step forward and a couple of steps back. And I really think a big beating, if they did were to ship something like that, then, you know, that is a lot to lose really, you know, for this Cork, uh, for the development of this squ uh, Cork squad. 
So, um, yeah, from the neutral point of view, I suppose they have nothing um, to lose, certainly, but like from their own development and for um, Cork football's development, they have a lot to lose here. And, and I think they, you know, they need to get, they, they'll be looking to get very close to Dublin. And, and similar to the Kerry game, I think, you know, they, they'll be pushing it as far as they can and going for as long as they can to stay in the game and stay in the fight. Um, and I think that is important, staying in the fight. Um, I think, was it the um, the, the Vodacom Bulls um, manager there, Jake White, when they played Leinster in the semi-final of the, um, of the rugby, the, the um, United Nations uh, rugby thing? Um, he was saying that it was so important for them to stay in the fight for as long as they could. And he, and he was saying he was reiterating that message to uh, his team all week. And, you know, they did just that. They stayed in the fight, even when Leinster had their purple patches. They stayed in the fight. And I think that's critical as well for... Um, Cork against Dublin, and um, you know if, if they put up the white flag early on, you know Dublin will go to town on them. So I think it's very important that for as long as they can, they stay in that fight, you know, and and push it as uh, uh, as much as they can. And I think that's critical to them. Holly, a nice easy question for you to open with: How can Cork stay in the fight on Saturday evening? Are we are we looking at the template of Cork against Kerry in that Munster semi final? If we're 15 minutes in, Cork were just down by one point against Kerry. Okay, Kerry pulled away in the end. But that was a game for 50 minutes. Is, is there? Can we use that game as a template for what might happen in Croke Park on Saturday evening? Well, I, th- I think that 50 minute performance was a, a template for Cork going forward. If you know what I mean, um, it was a, it was a real step up on, on what had been produced in the league. But if, if you if you peel this back and look, we can we we can look at Dublin over the last 10 years, or we can look at Dublin this year, and you know up until the Kildare game, everyone was saying it was a Kerry versus someone else final, you know, that Kerry were going to beat Dublin in the final, but all of a sudden, or Dublin in the semi-final, but all of a sudden after that performance, it looked like the juggernaut was back, if you know what I mean mm-hmm. but, like, if you if you look back at, at at the year's performances and I said it this week already in, in my column, you know, Dublin have only won two league games, and I know they were Division 1 games they were very, very poor early in the year they had no hunger, there was no bite about them you know, very similar to Cork, who kind of started to pick it up towards the end of the league um, Dublin were relegated, and I think that could have been the the kind of catalyst for what happened against Kildare. That you know there are still the bones of eight or nine of that team that are racking up six, seven, eight All Irelands, and you know these boys are proud. They're not very old yet. Um, I know the quality that might be coming into the Dublin team isn't what might have been coming in in the past, but they still have two thirds of their team that are highly experienced, superb footballers. If they're given time, if they're given space, and if they're hungry, you know, that was the big thing during the day. You could see their hunger was gone. You know, you could see last year when they lost their all earned title, when, when they were beaten, you know, the same bite wasn't there. So <clears throat> I wouldn't say Cocker without a chance. Um, I think, you know, it, it is a two horse race, and we've seen 20 things happen in GA before. But, you know, we will have to be absolutely at it 100% from the start. You know, we were just talking there before in the boat. You know, sometimes if you were playing a better team that you might set up defensively and hope to maybe size these boys up and, and see what they're made of and stay in the game for as long as you can. But Kildare tried that and Kildare had beaten them in the league and they got absolutely torn apart for the first 25 minutes of the game, Dublin bag five goals. So I think Cork have to go at it 110% from the very start and give no Dublin player time or space. Obviously how they set up behind and how they cope on their own kick out is going to be huge as well. But I think bring that fever that we shot against Kerry from the start and see where it takes us. Just on that, dear mid and, and Holly mentioned there about that, that Dublin performance against Kildare in the Leinster final. I think they were up 5 17, five first half goals. And the Dublin juggernaut was kind of starting to pick up a bit of speed there as well. And they look at this Cork defence and they'll be licking their lips because Cork shipped a lot of scores in the National League. And even go back to the last day against Limerick, they, they still coughed up 1 116. So, how can this Cork defence? try and hold this Dublin team? <clears throat> well, if you go back to the Dublin Kildare game and if you studied how the Kildare goals came about, a lot of them came from runners from deep and um, where the Kildare players weren't picking up the Dublin runners and um, they were attracted very often to the ball. So if a ball was passed on, there was two or three players attracted to the ball and then they weren't picking up the Dublin runners. But I think funnily enough, Cork um, are pretty good at that aspect of their game. They're pretty organised now. And um, even against Kerry, you know, Kerry did have a lot of points, but they didn't have a huge amount of goal scoring chances. Um, and similarly, you know, Limerick scored one goal against them, Loud scored two, albeit one at the very end, you know. So I think if they can, um, 
you know, keep the goals out, then I think they're in, you know, with a fighting chance of staying in that game for as long as they can anyway. But um, obviously, you know, it's it's an old cliche now, but um, and it goes for many teams. But if you can stop goals going in one side, it definitely gives you a, a very, very good chance, you know. So I'd be optimistic enough that Cork won't concede. They, I, I'd be very optimistic they won't concede anything like um, Kildare conceded against Dublin, you know, which was the five goals. But um, obviously, this team, Dublin team, are very, very good. So um, even if they kept it to two goals, you know, I think it would be a plus, definitely. Let's look at the other end of the field, Holly. Look at the Cork attack. And we had John Hayes on the podcast last week, and he was he was waxing lyrical to degree about the likes of Stephen Sherlock, Brian Hurley and Colin O'Mahony, just the potential that that, that that trio have. And I was just crunching through the stats. And um, between the three of them, they've scored 75% of Cork scores in the championship so far. Cork have scored 441 and the three lads have scored 331 between them. So just from that stat alone, you can see how important uh, Sherlock, Hurley and Colum Annie are to this Cork team. What can they do or how can Cork set up to allow those three lads have the best chance to to get the scores that Cork need on Saturday evening? Yeah, look, they're, they're, they're three very talented players and, and, and we are lucky to have them. And there is no doubt about whatsoever that if Cork can, you know, break 50-50 in that middle third and try and ensure a decent supply of possession to these three boys will be in the game. Mm. But, you know, a lot of those scores, if you looked at them, came from the likes of Potter and Matty Taylor and uh, and Johnny Cooper and Kevin Donovan coming with those late runs, creating the overlap and the final pass off and ended up with Hurley or, or Cahill Manny or Sherlock or ended up in a free that Sherlock converted. So, like, my worry on, 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 on Saturday evening is that, like, Dublin an extremely physical forward line. Um, they lined out the last day with um, Kilkenny and Costello and uh, Conor Callaghan and Dean Rock on the wings and in the corners. And they had two new boys down the middle. So, like, I'd be, I'd be worried that the physicality of particularly those four on the wings, that they have the, the, the power to stop the likes of Potter and... And uh, and Cooper and Kevin O'Donovan and Matty Taylor making those late runs, getting onto the Cork attack to create those overlaps because they're extremely physical. They're well down the line with regard to conditioning. They're seasoned campaigners. And that's a major aspect of Cork's game that Dublin will definitely target because, you know, we're not doing well long on our kick out. A lot of our shark kick outs, we're dependent on these three or four boys that are very good transition players to get the ball up the field into our, ta- our attack. So, I think we, we 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 have the potential to make hay inside if we can get the ball in there quickly and if we do get our runners going. And I would love to see, and it, there were several opportunities for it there against Limerick, of the odd foot pass going into 30, 40 yards of space. But there was fellas pulling back and taking the short solar rather than putting it in there. And especially when you have the likes of those players, you saw Kyle O'Man, he was held for the whole game, got one one on one and stuck it in the back of the net. That's the kind of clash you're talking about there. And we need to, Cork need to create those situations where we're getting these boys one and one. And the only way that ever happens if, is if the ball is a bit quicker when it's on. No, it's not going to be an all day. But when it is on, they have to take it. The last day, they won't take it when it was on. You remember how they mentioned there, I suppose, the, the, the strength that, that Dublin have in their tech. But this Dublin midfield mm-hmm. is not to be messed with either Finton and Lahif, like two, two top class players. And probably looking at E. Maguire and Cullum or Callaghan in their what can Cork do to break even here? Because Holly touched on it as well. Like the, the kick out hasn't gone well for Cork the last couple of games. It's 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 kind of it's a source of concern at, at this stage, especially when 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 Cork go along. So how can Cork break even in midfield? Is it just try and keep the ball away from from and um, from Finton and Lahey? For how, how how do you set up against a team at a midfield like that? Yeah, I think their their first option is probably to go short and you know secure the ball safely. But, you know, I, I expect Dublin will put massive pressure on the kick-out and they'll probably push up just to force them long then. And I suppose, you know, they didn't do well against Kerry in this area. So it, I assume it's been something they've been working on a lot, you know, in the meantime. So whether they have another short kick-out strategy or whether they're just working on the long kick-out, then, you know, I'm not really sure what they have been working on. But obviously it's a big, big ask. But, you know, kick-out is one area from the midfield point of view. On the ground then, Finton and Lahif are very, very good as well, you know. And uh, Finton in particular, you know, I don't know, is he a football leader a couple of times or certainly a multiple all-star winner anyway, you know, he's he's outstanding and he's going to take an absolute lot of watching, you know. So maybe Maguire will pick him up, which will free up O'Callaghan maybe to, you know, 
go on some of his forward surges, which he is very good at getting at the end of moves, you know, and he's, um, I think, nearly in every game he's played so far, he's come up with a few scores. So um, I suppose sometimes the, the best form of defence is attack yourself. And like, you know, Callan definitely can hurt teams on the other side because he is quick um, and he's very direct at running as well, you know. So he got a great goal against Louth um, as well. So I think, you know, it's a big, big ask, definitely. But if they, if they get anywhere near breaking even, then, you know, it'll be a big uh, plus for Cork. I just want to keep on the kickouts, um, Holly, because you've written about it in your Southern Star column um, this Thursday. Like, like I said earlier, it's been a source of concern, especially that game against Kerry down that final stretch. Cork just couldn't keep hold of their own kickouts. And it was Kerry attack after attack after attack. And they t- take down 12 points in those final 20 minutes. Um, how do you think Cork should approach their kickout strategy for Saturday evening? Because, like the Emmer said, if, if you go short, you're inviting huge Dublin pressure on you and you're probably just trying to get rid of the ball in and you're going to lose it further out the field. But if you go along, Cork have shown the last couple of games, it's not really working out that way. So what kickout strategy should Cork employ for Saturday? Well, I suppose, first of all, on top of Finton and Lihiv, you're then facing James McCarthy and Brian Howard as the two wingbacks, you know, who are two capable, very, very capable midfielders also and very, very good overhead. Um, I think variety is the absolute key. And w- one thing that kind of has annoyed me so far with, with the Cork kick out, Grant, they're good enough short and Crows are conceding short, hoping they'll go along. But that we can't get a decent contest to get the ball onto the ground. Like several times the last day against Limerick when we went long, I think we lost seven long the last day. There was two or three of them clean catches for Limerick, which should never happen. You know, so like at, at worst, if it is going wrong for a shard, like if we go along and even kick it into a crowd of cock players so that we get the ball on the floor and contest that ball on the floor, win the breaking ball, at least you have an attacking platform for the the field. And I know, look, it hasn't, that hasn't been happening for Cork. Maybe we're trying to, you know, and it happens an awful lot with keepers and we often fill into the trap ourselves as management where you're trying to pick very small places or spaces for the goalkeeper to try and target to put ball into. But sometimes, you know, particularly in situations like this, I see nothing wrong with route one, boom it down the middle, even if O'Callaghan and, uh, and Maguire are there contested at the same time, at least you can get all your breaking ball experts like Johnny Cooper and, and, and Rory Maguire and Matty Taylor and Jana and Den Odenine and all these boys in around it and try and come up with possession in the middle because... You know, if it comes to it and Dublin are hacking us or it's going wrong, it's far, far better to concede the kick out or make a contest of the kick out 70 yards from goal than it is to be losing ball 30 yards from your own goal and getting turned over by a bigger, more powerful forward. You know, now I also think that Brian Hayes wasn't um, on the squad the last day. Seemingly he was ill that he picked up some kind of a, a vomiting bug or something, but he could have a huge part to play in this game, I reckon, yet whether it's from the start or whether he could come in at wing forward or whether even he could go to the edge of the square because he's the kind of extra target that we've been missing um, over the league campaign and over the last couple of games. So I think, you know, and Crow Park could suit his style and his physicality and his, his movement, but particularly the fact that he is a six foot four, six foot five man. He's a huge target for a kick out, something that other people haven't, other opponents haven't seen so far this season. So I wouldn't be surprised if things were going not to plan to see him being sprung very fast or even starting this game. Just on that sort, dear Mitch, um, I already mentioned Brian Hayes as a maybe even a possible starter the next day. Can you envisage any changes to the Cork team that we saw against um, against Limerick the last day out? I know Sean Meehan is back training. I was talking to John Cleary earlier mm-hmm. and he said um, that maybe the game might come too soon for Sean Meehan, but maybe again, that's... Maybe that's clearly just trying to just trying to put us off, off, off the scent a small bit. But can you see any changes or would you make any changes to the Cork team for Saturday? Probably just the one Holly mentioned there. I think Brian Hayes um, is, you know, he's such an outlet in so many different positions. And he were in the forward line, really, plus midfield. Um, so just, just adding to what Holly said, I think Brian Hayes is the one real option that could make a serious difference. Um, anyone else? I'm not so sure they'll have the impact that Brian has, but... Um, you know, he he adds serious bulk, strength, uh, pace as well, you know. And, and uh, when you think back to the league game that Dublin played our man as well, you know, Reno O'Neill at full forward, like, uh, absolutely made hay against Dublin, a big mobile man, you know. So 
and Dublin at times, you know, they're not overly defensive. They they sometimes, you know, might have one uh, one sweeper, but they don't overdo it at times. So you know, someone like Brian Hayes um, adds the variety to the Cork attack and which just keeps the the Dublin defence guessing a bit. So um, I think he's the one real option, definitely for sure. Well, have you mentioned that this was a progress? Just add to what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah. Just add to what you're saying there. Um, like <clears throat> if you look at the Dublin full back line, they're not big players. You know, they have Merchant in there, Fitzsimons, and I can't think of the the, the other new guy that, that was in there last year. But like, there is a lack of height there, so that definitely is a place as well where and like Dermot said, O'Neill is a huge man. We've seen his the depth of his talent in the game since with Armagh. He really exposed the Dublin full back line that they with his power size, pace, aerial ability which they weren't able to cope with. So look, you've got to look at those kind of avenues and look for chinks in the armour. And that 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 is a chink, definitely. Holly, we mentioned earlier, I suppose, the progress this Cork team have made from, from that first game. I think it was a way to Roscommon back at the very end of January. Um, obviously, the struggles through Division 2, but <clears> of their, their last five games, Cork have won four of those games, albeit against teams that you'd expect this Cork team to beat. But they've gone out and beaten them. They've, they beat Offaly and Down when they had the, they've beaten Limerick and Loud. So, um, and there are games that maybe this Cork team would have lost er- earlier in the year. So, we can see some progress in that. So, when you're looking at this Cork football team from the journey they've been on the last six months, what gives you, I suppose, optimism and hope for the future? Well, I, I, I think definitely since January, our fitness and our physicality has improved hugely. Even look at the players up close now the last day against Limerick, the likes of Rory Maguire. You know, Brian Hayes, I mentioned wasn't there at last, but we saw him against Lode. A lot of the, the you know, even John O'Rourke, you know, his, his ability. I was looking at Damien Gore, wa- warm me up, like Damien Gore's body completely in the last two years. I'd say he's at least a stone and a half heavier than he was when I saw him playing junior football the last time for uh, for for um, for, for Kilmackaby. So, look, it was poor start to the year. Um there's no doubt about it with two games to go on the league when you were facing relegation and all the press talk and the general conversation was around the Telton Cup and that we might even win the Telton Cup. If someone said to you then that we'd, play, we'd go on to play all or, or an all or quarter quarterfinal against Dublin, you would have bitten their hand off. You know? And look, Cork, you know, you, you can talk about the lucky draw with Lord and Limerick, but, you know, they're the teams they got in the draw. They're teams that definitely benefited the progression of this team. You know what I mean? That they were playing teams that they probably were expected to be, but Cork needed those games from a mental point of view and from a confidence point of view to get to where they are today. And look, I, I expect Cork to put in a big performance on, on, on Saturday evening. And whether it'll be good enough and whether they're string to conditioning, a team with so many players so far down the line with regard to string to conditioning. But if Cork can take Dublin to, you know, as far as they took Kerry and maybe 10 minutes beyond, we'll all be delighted with that and it'll be a huge platform for next year. Do you I think as well, just before you go, I think as well, like, you know, there's a definite sense of purpose about this Cork team now as well. You know, over the last couple of years, they were so inconsistent. You didn't know what you were going to get from one game to the next. But like, they seem to have a plan now and, you know, they seem to be... Um, they seem to be very aligned to it, you know, and every time they go out, they're, they're, they're playing according to the script. And, um, you know, I know they played loud, they played Limerick, but even against Curry, you know, nobody gave them a chance in that game and they stuck in the game for 50 minutes and they had a plan and, um, you know, it, it, it bowed them well and they stuck in the game for so long. And similarly against Limerick and, and loud, even when, when loud came at them there at the end, you know, there was a sense of steeliness and purpose about them, you know, that they would held that last um kind of a couple of attacks from Loud and just did enough to win the game. And even Limerick, you know, Limerick, a lot of people last week were talking about Clare's big victory, but people must remember as well that Limerick actually beat Clare, um, albeit on penalties, but they beat him in the Munster Championship. So, you know, Clare got a lot of kudos for beating uh, Ross Common. And I think, you know, that must give Cork some bit of hope as well going out against Dublin, you know, um, um, as well as, you know, that they can push them for long periods as well. But overall, I think there's a sense of purpose about this Cork team that hadn't been there in the last few years. They seem to now know what they're doing. Uh, they seem to have a plan. And I think um, whether it's John Cleary or Keith Ricken, but uh, whoever it is, they seem to have added a bit of steeliness to the setup as well. Um, and I think that's all huge progress because 
as I said at the start, like they were just so inconsistent for the last few years and they, it was hard to make sense of the whole Cork setup, you know, and, and it's definitely something that they can build on going forward, I think. Dear, dear, you're involved with the Ireland Rovers senior management this year, so I'm going to throw this next one to you and it's kind of left field. When I was talking to John Cleary earlier, I said, is there any chance that one of the Cork hurlers could be parachuted into the football setup this week, given that the hurlers were were knocked out the weekend. And I, I'd mark Keane in mind, given what he did um, a couple of years ago for, for Cork against Kerry. And, and Cleary burst my bubble very quickly. He said, no, he said, it, it, it just won't happen. It's too short. But is it, could something like that happen? Could we see something kind of totally left field where, where, where Cork football just up for one of the hurlers, kind of like Mark Keane, bring him in as just a, a plan C, an, an, an option D to have in the bench? I, I wouldn't agree with it, to be honest, because uh, I think, like, like John said to you there, I think a week is just way too short notice. Um, if it was three weeks or something that you could do a little bit of work with them and train or something, fair enough. But I think a week is just too much of a distraction. And I think it unsettles the camp as well. Fellas who've been with them all year, suddenly all the talk becomes about uh, one of the car hurlers coming into the camp, you know. And, and I, I personally don't think I think they've been working hard and they've made progress with this current group. Um and I think, you know, whoever comes into the camp needs to work for it at least certainly longer than a week anyway. And, and fair enough, if they give a commitment for next year, by all means, I think the Cork footballers would be delighted with them. But I, I wouldn't agree with um, parachuting someone in at this late stage, definitely. It shows why I'm this side of the white line. Can I just add something there, Karen, if you wouldn't mind? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I heard there recently, and, and it goes along with what you were saying there, that Dublin are after bringing in the full back from the hurling team and to the football panel. I can't think of his name now, but see me, he's a big guy, he plays fullback generally, so it might be to add a bit of size and power to their fullback line, whether he'd make an appearance or not. No, but it, I, his name is gone for me, but they, 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 they brought somebody in from their hurling panel, but their hurling, hurling team are probably beating a little bit longer than Cork. And, and also Dublin are at a different stage now, you know, they're a seasoned outfit, you know, they can take these things in their stride more, but... <laughs> As a developing team, I think that could have an effect of unsettling the team for for all its ben- potential benefits. I think it outweighs, you know, um, the damage it could potentially do as well. I think. Before I come for your predictions, um, another one for for you, Holly. The the fact that this game is on in Croke Park on Saturday night at six o'clock, like it's very uncork fan friendly. And we talked about this in last week's podcast with John Hayes. We had it on the front page of the Southern Star as well. And obviously the games this weekend are going ahead in Croke Park, the four quarter finals. But is this something that the GA should kind of learn from in, in years to come? When you have whether it's Kerry Mayo, kind of like the Gaelic Crowns in Limerick is kind of it seems like an open goal for that game. Even this Cork Dublin game, bringing the Parky Creeve or Turles, would you would you hope that in future that the GA might take the quarterfinals out of Croke Park and just bring them around to the, the, the provincial venues? Yeah. Um, look, I just remember from my own time, we played Dublin National League final in, in, in Parky Creeve and there was some kind of a home and away arrangement and, and the Dubs are brilliant to travel. Mm-hmm. They never, they never, you know, their, all their games are at home. They love travelling away from home. And I think there was about 20,000 Dubs there that day and about maybe 10 Cork. But, you know, they, they, they love getting out. But there's, you know, there's, there's probably the whole political side of it as well that a lot of this is being dictated by corporate boxes and by by sponsorship where you know if you pay for your corporate box you're guaranteed so many so many um intercounty games per year and with no super eights anymore you know that was kind of ticking that box for an awful lot of those those, those um those little provisos but i definitely think for for a quarter final stage and you know we won't see a quarter final stage with the new setup next year. But you know, there's there's no doubt about it that Cork and Dublin and Torless would have been a fantastic outing for, for all of us and you get a big Cork support there. But it's you know, the footballers definitely benefited from the increase in support from the low game to the Limerick game and previous to that. You know, if you see five thousand Cork supporters in, in, in Crow Park, you know, it'll be a lot because six o'clock is a terrible time. And a lot of people would have gone up in the past for a six o'clock game and stayed up that night, but that's nearly out the window as well with the cost of hotels and all hotels available and all the rest of it. So look, it's a pity. I think they're 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 satisfying the the the, the whole issue with sponsorship and 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 car boxes, and plus the fact that they know six o'clock on Saturday evening they'll probably be a very big Dublin following as well because they're at home and it'll suit people to go along to the game before they head out or whatever. But it's a uh, it's it's definitely a missed opportunity for for. Promoting the game within, within within Cork particularly at the moment because football was at a, at a low ebb and you could see things growing, and it would have been great to get a big outie in Torlus with 
you know, a big travelling support from Cork to support the team. And th- those kind of things do matter to players. And last day, even on the pitch, seeing, uh, you know, the likes of Sherlock and Brian Hurley and then on these days being surrounded by young lads and autographs and this kind of thing. You know, we, we, we don't see enough of that with Cork football. And that's the kind of thing that, that you know, set, sets those seeds of growth in young fellas' um, minds that they want to play for the county. So it is a missed opportunity, I think, no doubt. Prediction time. So to you first, dear Miss, <clears throat> what's going to happen Saturday night and who's going to win? Okay, well, hey, the spread is 12 points and um, I think the spread was similar against Kerry and, you know, the bookies were, were spot on with their spread. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a tricky one because, um, you know, Corker Lima here, do they go, even though it's a free shot, as you uh, as you alluded to in your first question, it's a free shot for Cork and Ways, but, you know, if they go all out and attack uh, and say, look, let's go for this quarter final, we have nothing to lose, they're at risk then of conceding a massive score. And I think for their development... I think that's not going to bode well for them in next year and the year after, you know. So then the other option is uh, the template they use against Curry, which is go very, very defensive for as long as they can mm-hmm. and see can they stay in the fight or stay in the game for as long as they can. I think that's the template they're going to go with. I think they have no choice. Um, Dublin, they have to respect Dublin and, and Dublin's history and Dublin's quality of players as well. So I think that's the way they have to go. So, you know, if they stay in the game for 50 minutes, 60 minutes, I still think you're you're looking like a, D- a Dublin victory of probably, I think if they hold them to seven or eight points, you know, they'd be doing well. I think that would be a huge plus going forward if they can keep Dublin to that. Um, but look, um, unfortunately, a Dublin win, uh, you know, we'd all love Cork to, see, to, to win, but it's probably just too much beyond them at this stage. Same question to you, Holly. How do you see the game panning out? And give me your prediction as well. I, I agree with Dougie that uh, that Kerry is the template, <clears throat> but I think Cork will, if, if they're to make a serious fight of this, we'll need at least two goals mm. and not concede the same on the other side because Dublin will kick 16, 17 points, but we don't, we can't afford to have a 217 or a 317 on the Dublin side. If that's the case, that's going to be 10 points or 12 points. But I could see this if Cork get out of the blocks and if we turn up to a man and make an absolute dog fight out of this for as long as we can, I could see us getting within five. In Thursday, Southern Star, in his, in his, in his column, Hawley's kind of uh, class this game is David against Goliath. We all know what happened when David and Goliath went into battle. So, Cork are not without hope this Saturday night. So, thanks for joining us on the podcast again, lads. In this week's Southern Star, get your free Things to See and Do in West Cork magazine. Over 100 pages with places to go, a what's on guide, and suggested walks, cycle routes, and picnic locations. A handy guide for you, your family, and visitors this summer. Don't miss your free Things to See and Do in West Cork magazine inside this week's Southern Star. Delighted to be joined by Avril Condell of Access Credit Union, who's here to tell us a little bit about cultivate farm finance so avril maybe just give us a brief introduction to what cultivate farm finance actually is so cultivate is a collaboration of 40 credit unions uh, throughout ireland and um, west cork has both access credit union and bantry credit union uh, the loan itself is up to seventy-five thousand unsecured uh, for seven years is the max term but obviously can be uh, personalized and customized to each individual's needs Um, It's a great facility actually for for farmers um, because it covers cash flow and machinery purchases like there's a fertilizer crisis now as we know and so literally anything that is required for the farm can be covered by this loan. The the rate is very competitive and we can match the the repayment term and the um, repayment frequency to each individual farmer depending on their enterprise. Um, And you also have the benefit of the life cover that comes with the credit union loan, which I think is very important for people these days at no extra cost. And if I'm a farmer and I'm listening to you on this podcast today, how can I get involved? So if you're not sure of which credit union um, you're involved with, you can go to Cultivate Credit Union directly, which is www.cultivate-cu.ie or you can phone 1800 839 999. And if Access is your credit union, you can contact me directly. So it's avril at accesscu.ie or you can ring me on 085-268-2727. The Athletics Ireland National Track and Field Championships take place at Morton Stadium in Santry this weekend. And Kieran has been speaking to sprinter Joan Healy ahead of the meeting. But Kieran, before we hear from Joan, maybe tell us about some of the other 
West Cork athletes that we should be looking out for this weekend? Yeah, it's going to be a busy weekend for West Cork athletes on and off the track at Martin Stadium in Century. So, of course, Phil Healy is going to be there. Um, Phil Healy will be looking for her 16th senior national title between indoors and outdoors. So Phil will be trying to defend her 400 meter women's crown. And that is on Sunday, as far as I know. Or sorry, now I'm just looking at the schedule. Sorry, the heats of the women's four, 400 are on Saturday with the final din on Sunday. So it's going to be a, a busy weekend for Phil Healy as she steps up her preparation for a, a busy summer that will include the European Athletics Championships um, in August. Also, Dara McElhinney will be in action too. Dara is also gearing up for the European Championships later this summer, and he'll be in action in the men's 5,000 metres. If we think back to 2020, Dara, in his first year up at, uh, up at senior level, he actually won gold in the men's 5,000 metres at last year's national championships, he stepped down to the 1500 meters and he finished just outside the medals, but he's back up to the 5000 meters this year. And that's the distance that he's hoping to be selected on for the Europeans. So two of our big medal hopes, as usual, are Dara McElhinney and Phil Healy. But I think, Jack, one of the, the big stories from a West Cork point of view for this weekend is Joan Healy in the women's 100 meters. And I think we can officially call Joan a friend of the show. We've had her on the podcast a good few times now. And she has had no look at injuries these past 18 months. And we've talked to her before about it. And we'll hear her quite soon chatting about her, her injury nightmare as well. But the good news is, and I fingers and toes crossed, and I, I'm touching wood right here now, is that Joan's look will turn because she does deserve it. Like she's been, she's been through the mill with injuries. But the good news is she is back on track and she's put in some very good times in the last couple of weeks. Um, her first race was in Carlo at the very, very end of May, and she did an 1167, I think it was, which wasn't too far off her PB. And she actually equaled her PB at a race in Geneva then um, a week or so later. So she's in very good form heading into the women's 100 meters. And it's going to be a busy Sunday for her because she's the heats um, first. I think the heats are around, I'm looking here, they're 20 past two and all going well. Then semi final is at 20 to four. And in the women's 100 meter final, will be at seven o'clock on Sunday evening. So the hope is that Joan will be there. She'll be in some company as well because um, the Irish sprint sensation, Rashida Adelecki, will be in the women's 100 metres as well. So that's huge competition for Joan. But she's back where she wants to be. And as you'll hear from her now, she's so optimistic about the months and years ahead. If anyone is due a bit of luck in their sporting adventures, it's Joan Healy. And we're delighted to be joined on this week's podcast by Joan. Um, Joan, we've chatted to you before about your injury worries. They were going back to late 2020 through to early 2021. Then your entire summer season last year was written off with an Achilles injury. And that flared up again last November. That scuppered your 2022 indoor season. But we're into the summer season now. So first off, I want to ask you, how are you? Please tell me you're fighting fit. I'm fighting fit. I'm delighted. I've already exceeded my expectations for this summer. So race by race, I'm having to set new goals, but I'm just so happy to be back um, running, back on the track, on the start line um, and in one piece. That's absolutely brilliant to hear. I think back in February, I just touched base with you to see your plans for the year. And of course, you've the, the Worlds and the Europeans are some of the big events um, this year. But you told me that you're focused on getting back racing, staying healthy and getting some consistent training in. So how has that gone for you the last couple of months? Um, to be honest, uh, it was not a straight line. Um, I suppose the last time I was on the podcast with you was last summer. Um with Phil and the Olympics and we thought by then you know we had really gotten a grasp on the Achilles issues mm. to be honest it was only starting um so I got back into winter training I started um with a new setup with Dervla Rourke and Marion Heffernan as my two track coaches um and we were going really well until November and then I was getting this like weird irritation couldn't describe the pain um close to the Achilles and then I nicked my calf then as well with it. So I ended up spending close to 10 weeks, I think, 10 to 12 weeks off the track. Um, there was a buildup of fluid in the area. We couldn't get rid of it. Um, so I was on the bike. There was no running at all. Um, by the time nationals came around, I obviously knew then at that stage that I wasn't going to be doing an indoor season. So when, when I had touched base with you, 
um, I had just started back on the the Ultra G, the anti gravity treadmill, um, just to try and get some weight through it. And we only started at like fifty percent of my body weight, so it was really like back to basics. Um, and then I suppose I got a I got a good run. I got a good few sessions in there again. Um, and then out of nowhere, the other leg started. Um, so then I had pain in in both sides. Um, it was manageable. I was able to to get some sessions in, but you know you were going session to session. You couldn't really plan. Um, so we didn't really know where we were, what we were going to be doing for the rest of the season. Um, I did get out on warm weather training uh, in Spain with Phil back in um, May. Uh, the first week went okay-ish. The second week I spent in the pool and on the bike. I uh, wasn't able to run. I couldn't get out of bed pain-free. Both Achilles were absolutely killing me. Um, so I had to unload it again for another while. To be honest, at that stage, then I was questioning what in the name of God am I doing? Like, why am I doing this to myself? Um, I just couldn't see the end in sight. Um so eventually back to the consultant again and I had to get a different procedure done on both legs again, which involved another injection. But um, I had to get the two legs done on the same day. And at that stage, that was the middle of May. Yeah, so I was I was two weeks out from what we were planning was going to be my first race. Um, and here I was with two legs injected, not able to fully walk, hobbling around in in crutches but it cleared it um I'm still not without pain I think I'm just gonna have to accept now that there is going to be some part to me that's going to be aching every morning that I get up and every time I step on the track but it's manageable I'm able to get my sessions in um they're good quality sessions um and we I suppose we just reached the point then where we were like we're just we just have to get to the start line no matter what kind of state I was in we didn't know because we weren't able to put sessions back to back um so that's when I opened up in Carlo um a few weeks ago went back to basics started running some Munster and Leinster championships and yeah pretty much shocked myself really with um how quick I opened up like you've had no luck whatsoever injuries over the last couple of years so what no, no. Kept you, what, what, what's kept you going John what what keeps you motivated like Where's this drive coming from to say, I'm going to keep going because I want to get back on the track? It's uh, it's very hard to describe. And I suppose unless, you know, some, you're talking to someone and unless they're involved in sport or have been involved in sport at some level themselves, um, it's hard to understand. But I suppose I've been doing this since I've been 11. And I suppose when I started out, I had a lot of success and I suppose always thinking back to that and constantly wanting more. And I just felt that, you know, I haven't yet achieved or, you know, I wasn't happy with my current achievements um, and what I hadn't yet achieved. So I suppose that was the only thing really that was driving me. Um, I just felt that if I, I gave up there and then that, you know, in a few years time, I would have regretted it, even though there was plenty of times during the winter that I was like, no, I am done. I can't do this anymore. There was lots of tears. I was very hard to put up with uh, for those that were around me. Um, but I suppose just just not wanting to have to live with the regret down the line was really the the one thing that kept me going. And the good news is you are back on track. You mentioned that race in Carlo and you were on, on Instagram and I'm just going to call it out now. You said two years since my last 100 metres, I finally made it to the start line. 11.67 to open the season. Delighted to be pain free and to take the win onwards. Tell me about that feeling. What was that race like in Carlo? First to be on the start line, then to get a, a, a run like that in. Well, to be honest, the nerves were so insane. I was on the start line and I actually wanted to run the other direction um Phil was there as well uh first time I suppose I've been racing and Phil has been the supporter so it was nice to see it she was there with mom as well um so the first race I ran uh I ran 1183 in the, in the heat um and I crossed the line and I I genuinely we we all gen had a genuine fear that you know this this could be like a real you know 12 something here we, we just didn't really know what to expect so when I crossed the line and I saw the 118 on the clock I 
to be honest, I actually burst into tears before I had stopped slowing down. Um, but then after that, you know, Derville got onto me and, you know, just something, you know, that I'm, I wouldn't probably have been used to with previous coaches. You know, we would have been happy with that race and we would have been like, okay, go on, go out and enjoy the next race. But Derville said something to me and, you know, it just really drove me on. She said, you know, don't let the relief of the first race be all you get out of today. And she was like, I think you can go two tenths faster. So I was like, oh my God, she's mentioned two tenths. Now I'm just, I'm going to have to commit to it. Um, and there it was. I, I got my, my two tenths and brought it down to 11.6. Uh, that was incredible. And you've mentioned there, um, uh, Derville and Marion Hefflin, that, that change of coach and training over the winter. What was the reason behind that? And what do what do Derville and Marion bring? Because obviously they're huge experienced athletes in their own right. But what, are you, what, what can you learn off them? Um, well, I suppose, first of all, I made the move because, you know, myself and Alan had been um, with each other for probably close to, to seven years. And I suppose we just... You know, I was getting a lot of niggles and we were finding it hard to, you know, get a breakthrough. And I suppose we just felt that at that stage, we'd kind of taken it where we could um, each other with each other. Um, you know, like I have a lot of respect for Alan and he brought me to where to where I am. Um, but I just felt I just needed a change. Um, I needed a new environment. Um, and it was a change a big change at the start like I'm, I'm on my own you know I don't have any training partners um until my boyfriend uh you know joins in every now and then as as the rabbit but um I suppose Daryl then kind of came on the scene you know we were kind of having a few conversations about you know I was kind of in limbo and where to go and I suppose we just it, it just started out very organically it, mm. it, you know it didn't go into oh you know I'm looking for a coach and I'd like you to coach me um it, you know started off with just the two of them coming to the track and just having a look at some of my sessions and that was back when I you know I was just doing tempo stuff back last summer just trying to keep fit um so I suppose we kind of really nailed things down then really in the winter um and I suppose the two of them committed um Derville in fairness you know really pushed for setting up a really good um team around me so we got a new gym coach and I got a new physio and to be honest without the whole lot of them working together I probably wouldn't have made it to the start line a few weeks ago um but what they bring I suppose you know um I suppose the two of them have been high performance athletes mm -hmm. themselves I mean Derville's a world champion um and it's just I suppose it's the attitude in, in terms of constantly looking for something more um, and not coming away, just being like, oh, yeah, that was grand. I'm happy enough with that. You know, things like, you know, when you're setting targets for longer runs at training, um, you know, I would have usually set it a target for 100 metres that would have been close to my PB, which was 11.5. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dervil is now setting, you know, those targets based off the 100 metre PB of 11.3 which I haven't reached yet, but, you know, she's, she's, she's put the number out there. Um, so she's making me want to reach it. So I suppose bringing that, um, plus they're extremely calm. Like there's no panic. I suppose they've been, they've been through it all themselves. You know, they, they know how to, you know, to plan the season in terms of, you know, we need to take it easy here and not worry too much about this stage of the season. Um, and then gradually be able to, to ramp it up. Has this fresh start um, re-energised you in some way? Like getting these, these, these two new voices, like you said, this new training team around you, touch wood, your injury troubles are behind you, you're back in the track now. Do you feel, do you feel like there's the, the best could be yet to come? Like, like we, we could see the best of Joan Healy over the next couple of months and years? Oh, definitely. A hundred percent. I mean, and that's part of the reason why I kept at it. I just mm. feel like there's, there's something more there and... I'm hoping that the girls will, will be able to bring that out of me. I mean, uh, already, like I've done three races so far. I've done Carlo, which was 11.67. I did the Cork the following week, which was 11.61. And then I was in Geneva at the weekend and I equaled my PB at 11.57. So, you know, previously it would have taken me an entire season to even get to where I opened up this season. Um, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to to what the rest of this season is going to bring. I'm, I'm hoping, I, I do feel that there is a big PB in there. Um, I'm hoping it's going to appear next week at Nationals. But if not, there's going to be plenty of races 
for the remainder of the season. But I, yes, I, I do feel it's coming. Talking about the Nationals, so um, always a huge event in the Irish Athletics calendar. What's the, the hope, goal and target? Um, well, to be quite honest with you, uh, like I said there at the start, the goals are changing each week. Um, I suppose if you said to me a few weeks ago that, you know, I'd be aiming to run a PB at Nationals, I would have bitten the hand off you. Um, you know, I suppose in previous years, the you know, coming to nationals, I've probably opened up really quickly and then I've struggled to find form coming into it. Um, whereas now I feel like things are only just starting and I need the races to to get faster. So I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, it's never going to be shy of competition anyway. Um, Shida Adeleke is going to be back home and she's entered into the 100 metres. Um, Molly Scott is going to be in, in there as well after coming off of a, a red hot indoor season. Um, and then I'm thrown in there in the mix. And, you know, even though the previous years, you know, I haven't come into nationals in the best of form on the day, I've always managed to find something and managed to get myself on the podium. So this year, I'm definitely, there's definitely no doubts there. And I'm definitely going to be putting myself in the mix. So I'm, it's probably the first time in a long time I'm really excited for nationals. That's brilliant to hear because you mentioned Rashida there and Molly, like you said, they're coming off some superb times in the last couple of months. But that's that's mm-hmm. the company that you that that you want to be in, Joan. Like you, you want to hold your Absolutely. own and, and actually yeah. beat them, beat them. That's it. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's no, there's you know, it's, it's it's no good to me going up there to nationals and you know running away with it. We we everyone wants to see a race. I want mm-hmm. to be in a race, and I'm certainly not going to be shying away from from that kind of competition. Um, like Rashida so far has you know she's she's definitely run a lot faster than than I have already um Molly is in and around um where I'm at at the moment so um I definitely think it's going to be a really good race what's the plan so after the nationals I know we've the the world championships and the European championships mm-hmm. and I know the the 4 by 100 meter women's team relay team are, are going to the worlds in Oregon is that something that that's something on your that you're hoping to be part of or what is the plan um, well, I suppose it definitely wasn't a part of my plan uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the relay, uh, I ran on the relay as well in Geneva at the weekend, which was, it was great to be, to be back into that mix again. Um, so I think the Wednesday or the Thursday after Nationals, um, the relay has been invited to the Stockholm Diamond League. Mm-hmm. Um, so I will be making myself available for that. Um, hopefully the rest of the girls um, that will be in the 100 final as well will be will be on that team um, and then after that we've got Morton Games on the 1st and we've got Cork City Sports then on the 5th um, and I suppose all going well then and you know that I, I secure my selection that will be heading off to, to Oregon. Oh, that's brilliant to hear. Like again, again, fingers crossed, touch wood that everything goes crossed, according, exactly. according to plan. But just on the Cork City Sports for a second, I see that Phil has entered into 100 metres. <laughs> um, so have we uh, a Joan B. Phil showdown on the cards quite soon? I, ho- I hope so. I hope so. Um, she's down for the four as well. Um, we she, we kind of mentioned it in passing at Gene- in Geneva at the weekend. Um, you know, before I probably would have been like, oh, Phil, like for God's sake, will you just get out of the hundred like and give me a chance? But uh this weekend I was like, no, do it, do it. You know, it'll make both of us run fast. Um, and we always do run fast when we're when we're against each other. Um, so at the end of the day, that's all both of us want is is good times on the clock um and good times next to our names. So absolutely I'll welcome her in the hundred. I think we'd all be looking forward to that race. So hopefully that, that, that one comes off. And looking forward more forward to the summer. So the European Athletics Championships, again, is that something that you're hoping to be part of? Um, it is. Um, now, the 100 metre standard is the exact same as the world standard, which is 11.24, which is even outside the Irish record. Um, so I would need to break the Irish record in order to qualify. Um, probably not on my goals for for this year to qualify for the individual um is probably just that little step too far um but we we're still in the top 16 this is the top 16 that go for the relay mm-hmm. um it's mad to think that you know we have a qualification for the world championships but we still don't we're fully not secure yet for the europeans so we're still within the time frame the qualifying time frame when we're out in oregon so hopefully you know 
we haven't run the team yet with Rashida on it. Uh, and hopefully Rashida is going to be on the team in Oregon. So hopefully that will, you know, take a nice chunk off the national record and get us well inside the top 16. I think at the moment we might be sitting 14th, yeah. um, which is just a little too close for comfort. Um, with still a lot of teams left to run. Um, so hopefully we'll do it there. And we also have the Stockholm Diamond League as well. John, it's great to hear that your diary is so packed for the for the weeks and months ahead. Like I said earlier, if anyone deserves a bit of good look, it really is you, John. So I'm speaking Thank for all you. of us when I when I when I say I just hope your your look keeps and I hope you have a great nationals and I hope the rest of the summer goes according to plan. Thank you very much, Karen. In this week's Southern Star, get your free Things to See and Do in West Cork magazine. Over 100 pages with places to go, a what's on guide, and suggested walks, cycle routes, and picnic locations. A handy guide for you, your family, and visitors this summer. Don't miss your free Things to See and Do in West Cork magazine inside this week's Southern Star. Now, Kieran, before we preview this week's Southern Star sports section, I just want to let Listeners and viewers know that in this week's Southern Star, your free 104-page Things to Do and See in West Cork is back. This is a brilliant magazine when it's in the paper. It does exactly what it says in the tin. If you're looking for something to see or do while you're on your holidays in West Cork or while you're just out on a day trip, this is the magazine for you. It's got food, it's got walks, it's got bars, it's got activities. So just letting people know that's... Free in this week's Southern Star, a 104-page magazine for free. Where else would you get it? But Kieran, to go alongside that brilliant magazine, there's also, of course, a brilliant sports section. So maybe tell us a little bit about what's in this week's Southern Star sport. So yeah, we have a big look ahead to the Cork v Dublin game. That's the big match of the weekend. So there's four pages on that. So there's a lot to, for readers to sink their teeth into, including Holly O'Sullivan's inside track column, which is top class. As always, the Cork ladies were in action last weekend. They beat Donegal in their, their, their senior championship opener. And we talked to Shane Ronane because they're back in action against Waterford this Saturday evening as well. So a win there will give Cork a good draw in the All-Ireland quarterfinals. So as we can see, a lot of the championships in the county level are pushing towards the business end already. And that includes the senior Camogie championship. They had a good win against Waterford last weekend. And I was talking to Cork boss Matthew Toomey for Torres' Southern Star because the Cork Senior Camogie team is already guaranteed their spot in the All-Ireland semi-final with one game to spare. They're so far ahead in Group 1 with four successive wins that they just cannot be caught. But I think from a West Cork point of view, Orla Cronin missed the game against Waterford through injury. So I was asking Matthew Toomey about Orla because she's had an injury-plagued year so far. So Thursday Star is worth checking out for the latest on Orla Cronin's fitness as we head into the business end of the year. Also, and we have to mention it, Jack, the car curlers. My God, that was disappointing against Galway last Saturday. It just seems like an opportunity lost. They just, they never, they never got going. Like it's a game Cork, um, Cork could have won. They probably should have won 13 wides in the first half, but they just were not good enough again. And it's a, it's an all too familiar feeling with the, the Cork hurling team. And it's quite interesting that Kieran Kingston has come out fighting this week about about speculation in, in local media about his future. His three-year term is up, but he's not happy with what's been put out there. So um, he said it's disrespectful to speculate on the future of the Cork management. So you can read more about that in Thursday Southern Star. Bringing it back to club level or um, county level for a second, Bear of Footballers, they beat Muskery last Thursday night in the County Senior Football Championship Division Colleges section. We have a full report and reaction from both Muskery and Bear on that. But the great thing with this, Jack, is it has set up a Carberry v. Beira West Cork Senior Football Derby next Thursday week, June 30th, in Bantry at 7.30pm. And it's a winner-take-all. Whoever wins, Carberry or Beira advances to the final of this unseeded section while the loser bows out. So that's that's a game for, for us here in the Southern Star, Carberry and Beira, as West Cork will battle one another. Hard look though to the Carberry hurlers. They were out of the championship on Tuesday night. They, they lost to Musgrave and we have a full report on that. And just quickly going down through it, um, we have a report of the West Cork Schoolboys soccer team who finished 11th in the Kennedy Cup. Tim McSweeney of Kilmichael Rovers finished joint top score in the whole competition with six goals. Trina Rangers are filling up their trophy cabinet. They won the Premier Division Cup last weekend. Cal McCarthy gives his reaction to the Donegal rally. There's loads in there, Jack. So like, like always, there is something for everyone and finally, just to give Harness Racing uh, a mention, 
the season is ongoing at the moment. And Keen O'Reilly, he's an 18-year-old from Dreamer League. He drove his first career double last weekend. So any friends and family of Keen O'Reilly, pick up Torres' Southern Star because we have a report and picture from that. Just congratulations to Keen. It's a, a memorable moment for him. And it seems, talking to those in the know, it's the first of many. Brilliant stuff, yeah. And uh, that will obviously be in shops from Thursday morning. And if you can't make it to the shop, you can always subscribe online. Just go to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper and you can read the Southern Star on your computer, tablet or smartphone for less than two euro per week. And with this week's edition also featuring that 104 page magazine that I mentioned, that is incredible value. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast this week. We'll be back at the same time next week, hopefully talking about a famous Cork win over the dubs in Croke Park. If you enjoy these shows, please make sure to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Slán Tomlá. Mm-hmm.